Hey guys, Mrs. Noel here. The purpose of this video is to help you review the key concepts from the unit on homeostasis. Please have the note packet and a pen or pencil ready to go because you are going to be filling in information as I explain it. Feel free to pause the video if I get going too fast and you need time to catch up. Let's get started. On the front cover of the packet, there is a list of terms that you've learned in the homeostasis unit. The notes are going to define most of these words. Later in the lesson, you will be given the opportunity to complete a matching activity and a crossword puzzle to help you relearn the vocab. Let's start with the word homeostasis. Homeostasis is having a stable and constant internal environment. So if your body is at homeostasis, you are feeling good, you're healthy, you're not sick, you're pretty normal. A cell can be at homeostasis too. If that happens, the cell is diffusing materials needed, it's digesting things, it might be synthesizing things. Everything ha is happening at a normal speed. The enzymes are working efficiently. Now, how can a cell or an organism like yourself maintain homeostasis? You can maintain homeostasis through something called metabolism. Metabolism is all the chemical activities that happen in your body, like digestion or synthesizing enzymes or synthesizing hormones like insulin. All the activities that happen at a cellular level are part of your metabolism. All living things also maintain homeostasis by carrying out eight life functions. Whether you're one cell big or a trillion cells big, you carry on these life functions. Let's start with synthesis. Synthesis is to make or to build molecules. You would start from a small molecule, like an amino acid, and they would be put together to make a larger molecule, like a complex protein. Examples in your body, um, you make enzymes in your mouth. You make enzymes in your stomach. These are, these are chemicals that are going to help break down food in those places. Enzymes in your mouth are going to help break down carbohydrates. And in your stomach, the enzymes will help break down protein. The next life function is respiration. All living things carry on cellular respiration. I don't mean breathing, that's something different, but the life process of cellular respiration is when an organism or a cell uses glucose, which is a simple sugar, it uses it to make ATP. ATP is a fancy way to say energy. Now every cell in your body does this. It happens in the mitochondria. Mitochondria uses sugar that you ate to make this, this energy, this ATP. Then that ATP will be used for other things that the cell needs. The cell will need energy to carry out active transport or for synthesis. All living things also grow. Growth could be measured in increase of cell number or the actual size of the cell. In your body, many of the cells in your body divide by a process called mitosis. Mitosis creates more copies of cells. This can be measured in growth. In your body, you have a whole system that gets rid of waste. It's called the excretory system. But if we think more at a cellular level, every cell carries
carries out the process of excretion, and excretion simply means to get rid of chemical waste. Waste that your cells make are carbon dioxide, um, urea, there are nit um, nitrogenous waste that are nitrogen-based compounds that your cells need to eliminate. And ways that you can eliminate them are through your urine, sweat is, those are chemical waste, tears are very salty, those are chemical waste, and even exhaling that carbon dioxide every time you breathe, that is getting rid of CO2, which is a chemical waste. All living things carry on some form of reproduction. And I don't mean making a whole mother offspring. That's not what I mean. I mean repairing cells and making more copies of cells. So the example would be the process of mitosis, re repairing or, or replacing damaged cells. This happens most often in the skin cells of your body. They're constantly undergoing mitosis as you are constantly getting rid of skin cells and they're sloughing off your body every time you move or every time you scratch your skin, you're losing them. So you need to make more. So that's that's what I mean by reproduction. All living things also have a way to coordinate processes. Um, that's called regulation. So controlling many things happening at once is a necessary life function. Um, this happens in a single celled organism through the work of all the organelles. The nucleus, the cell membrane, the vacuole, the ribosome, the endoplasmic reticulum, they all have their own individual jobs, but they need to coordinate their actions so that they can work together very efficiently. Whether you're one cell big or an elephant, you have some form of circulation or a way to transport materials throughout the organism. So this life function is moving substances through an organism. In a human, it's the blood that does this for you. And the blood carries oxygen, nutrients, and it carries it to every cell of the body. Now, if you're an amoeba and you're only one cell big, you don't have blood, but you do have cytoplasm inside your cell. And those materials, the oxygen and the nutrients, would move through the cytoplasm to get to the proper organelle. And last but not least, every organism has to break down material somehow. It might not eat traditionally, like you would put food into your mouth and chew it up. It might not be like that. But any way a living thing can take nutrients and break it down so that it can be in a more usable form, that's considered digestion. Um, in your body, chemical digestion happens in your mouth, in your stomach, and in your small intestine because all of the lo those locations have enzymes, which enzymes, we'll talk about a little bit later, but enzymes are chemicals that help speed up the process of digestion or other processes in your body. Now, all of those things I just mentioned are ways that you can maintain homeostasis. But what happens if homeostasis is not maintained? What happens if some of those things aren't working the right way? Well, um, could get sick. There could be some disease, or it could be something pretty severe. Um, the organism might die if homeostasis is disrupted and cannot be recovered. Some examples of ways that homeostasis can be disrupted that you might be able to relate to. Um, having a little fever. I know you've had a fever, 100, 101, maybe even higher than that. That means you're not at homeostasis and things are not working normal. When you get a cold and you get a runny nose and you get a cough, or if you've had the chicken pox, you probably have not had the chicken pox because you've had a vaccine for it. But all those are just um, examples of how we can relate this to our body. Your body is pretty complex, so we need to understand what 
what's a pretty small part of your body? And then and then how how are we organized? Like what might be the smallest part and then the next biggest part and then bigger and bigger and finally what makes you a complete organism? So I have a list and I'm starting my list from the smallest component. And the smallest component would be an organelle. Now, there are things smaller than organelles, atoms, um, but we're not getting into the chemistry of it. We're going to stick with the biology term. Now, the word organelle could go in the circle diagram that you have there on the right, and it would fit in the smallest circle because an organelle can then make up cells. And cells would be in the next circle out. Cells in your body make up tissues. You get where I'm going with this? So your tissues would make that third circle out. You can make a list just like I did, but it's also important for you to put those terms in the circles. So organelles in the middle, cells the next circle, tissues the circle, the bigger circle on top of that. Now tissues make up what? Tissues are going to make up organs. Organs like your heart or your pancreas and your liver. Those are organs in your body. Now, organs make up systems of organs. So that heart is part of the cardiovascular system. Or the pancreas is part of your endocrine or digestive system. Now, all of those systems together help make up a very coordinated Organism, and the word organism would be on the outermost circle of that diagram. This diagram is commonly shown up on regents exams or something similar to this. You may have to find the right order, or you may have to find the right order of the words in the circle. So I would like you to write both the list, but also put all the terms in the circle. We've talked about how to maintain homeostasis, and we talked about all those life functions. Um, but if you're a single cell organism, you don't have tissues and organs and organ systems, a single cell organism has to rely on organelles. Now I'm going to give you information on different organelles and what they do specifically to help the cell maintain homeostasis. So I'm going to kind of show you a lot of information all at once. Um, let's start over here with the Golgi complex, and then we'll move clockwise around the diagram. So the Golgi complex is this structure right here. It looks like a bunch of pita pockets cut in half. Um, the Golgi complex prepares proteins to be moved to other areas of the cell. So the Golgi complex takes in proteins, and then it gets them ready to be transported elsewhere in the cell, or even exported from the cell completely. So it, it prepares them for that process, maybe puts some receptor molecules on the outside, but it, it gets them ready for what, where they're going to. A vacuole, this is an organelle that's going to store things. Um, in this animal cell here, it stores food, it stores water. It looks kind of small, looks like a little bubble, um, not something that you can see under the one of the microscopes that we have in, in class. Um, and in an animal cell, it's, it's considerably smaller than the vacuole you're going to see in the plant cell in a minute. One of the more important organelles, and it's so important that we're actually going to hit on it on the next page of the notes, is the cell membrane. And that's the, that's the membrane on the very outside of this animal cell. And that helps control what will enter and what will exit the cell. So what comes in, what goes out. Uh, ribosomes. Ribosomes, we've got speckles all throughout the cytoplasm here. We also have ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic or storm, or the rough endoplasmic or storm right here. The purpose of the ribosomes, this is the site of protein synthesis. This is where part of that protein synthesis process happens. Ribosomes are really, really small. They're probably the smallest organelle um, in the cell. Mitochondria. Mitochondria is this structure right here. It has a bunch of squiggly lines in the middle of it. The purpose of the mitochondria is cellular respiration. And I had mentioned that earlier when we talked about the life functions. But cellular respiration uses two things. 
It uses oxygen. It uses glucose from your food. And it makes that ATP. Makes that energy, which this cell will use, and these organelles will use, to carry out all of their life functions. Endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum helps to transport protein. Now, there are two kinds of the ER, which is what we call it for short. One is the rough ER and one is the smooth ER. The difference is the rough ER has ribosomes on the outside, and the smooth ER does not. At the bottom of our animal cell here, we've got a couple more things to add. Um, this is pointing to the chromosomes that are inside of the nucleus, and the chromosomes are what contain the actual DNA. That's where all of the genes are, which code for different traits of organisms. Um, and the number 46 should go with that. There are 46 chromosomes inside the nucleus if you're considering a human cell. Not all organisms have 46, only humans. Of all of the space in and around all these organelles, all the cytoplasm. This is the space where the organelles are located. This is where materials are transported. This is where all of the cellular processes take place in the cytoplasm space. And the nucleus. The nucleus is the structure in the center here. It is what holds the chromosomes and helps to coordinate all cellular activities. Now, plant cells, which is what we have at the bottom here, I didn't explain the function of everything labeled because a lot of those things are already explained up here for the animal cell. But there are a couple differences between a plant and an animal cell that we need to be very familiar with. The first one is the plant cell has a cell wall. The purpose of the cell wall is to make the cell very rigid and sturdy. It helps plant cells to um, give them their shape. And um, the, the cells in a, in a stem of a plant or a leaf of a plant helps them to stand up or lay nice and flat to absorb the sun. Plant cells also have chloroplasts. I did take a marker here and color some of them in green because they are green due to the chlorophyll. But this is where photosynthesis happens. Those chloroplasts absorb light. The other thing that's different about a plant cell is that it has a vacuole, but it's huge. Look at this picture. This whole space right here is the vacuole, um, whereas if in a plant cell it was really, really small. The vacuole in the plant cell does hold lots of water. Um, it can also store other things, like if it's a cell in a flower or a petal. The vacuole will actually hold the pigment to that petal. So if you're looking for your red rose, where's that red color? The red color is typically found in the vacuole. Uh, let's get some more detail about the cell membrane. I have labeled it in the diagram, but there are three main things that a cell membrane does, and you need to be familiar with all that the cell membrane can do for a cell. I had said before that it lets things in and out of the cell. Let's let's Put that down again. Materials will go in and out of the cell, passing through the cell membrane. The cell membrane is also what allows a cell to communicate with other cells. Now that communication happens through hormones, which are chemicals. One cell might release a hormone, and another cell might receive the hormone, which means it's received the message. But the cell membrane is where all of that communication takes place. And the third thing is that cell membranes can help recognize other cells. They recognize cells in your body as you, because all the cells in your body have little tags on them that say your name. Well, not really your name, but they're all labeled you, and your body recognizes it and knows who they are supposed to be there. If for some reason something foreign gets into your body, like a bacteria cell, the bacteria cell isn't labeled like your cells are, so it looks very different. And the cell membrane is what can determine that that's not supposed to be there.
Materials can get in and out of the cell through the cell membrane. And there are two types of transport in which materials will cross. One, we'll start on the left, is called active transport. Now, active transport uses energy. Energy is required for the active transport of materials. This is when molecules were moved from a low concentration to a high concentration. Passive transport doesn't need any energy at all. It's the natural flow of materials. This is the way that molecules naturally want to move from high to a low concentration. This is like you sledding down a hill. It's very easy to sit on the sled and at the top and make your way down to the bottom. But getting back up to the top, that's going to require some energy. That would be um, related more to active transport. If we look at our pictures, the picture that goes with active transport shows these little green squares. There's not many of them over here on the left, but they are being they are moving into the cell. So here's our low concentration, moving to a high concentration, and here's our energy. It has to have energy to do it because it's moving against the concentration gradient. Over here on our passive transport side, we've got a high concentration, and all these little molecules are moving to where there's nothing, a really low concentration. And those molecules are going to move until they're all equaled out. So all those green molecules are equally balanced, covering all of that space. Passive transport has two examples. One is diffusion. Molecules, any molecule moving from high to a low concentration. And the other is osmosis. And osmosis is when we specifically talk about water, only water. The osmosis is the diffusion of water. I had mentioned that cells, the cell membrane, is essential in communicating with other cells. This picture is a good representation of that. This little blue dot, blue on mine, uh, that's, that's an example of a hormone. This cell right here releases the hormone through the cell membrane. That hormone is then searching out the target cell. It will fit in with a receptor with a complementary shape. There might be lots of other cells with other receptors, but only the receptor that fits the shape of that hormone will receive the message. So important things to know. Hormones are a specific shape. There's other things that you learn in the living environment that are also shape-specific, like antibodies and enzymes. Well, hormones are also shape specific. Hormones are only going to fit into receptors that will receive their shape. So only those cells receive the message. The message is sent when the hormone combines with the target receptor. Um, we've talked about cells and things inside the cell and how things can get in and out, and now we've talked about how cells can communicate, but how do cells get energy? Um, we know that they need that ATP to do stuff, to do life functions, but how, let's get some details on how they obtain that energy. So there are two processes that happen in cells. One is photosynthesis. That's only going to happen in plants. It happens inside a chloroplast. And this is when plants absorb light energy from the sun, and they convert it into a chemical form of energy, which is glucose. Light that comes from the sun is energy, but it's in a form of energy that plants, they can't do anything with it. They can't use it. So the process of photosynthesis is kind of changing the energy into a more usable form for plants. So 
respiration, this is where cells, or the, the mitochondria in a cell, is going to take glucose to convert it into ATP, which is a more usable form for um, cellular function. Now that glucose comes from whatever the organism eats. Um, in a plant, it comes from the photosynthesis that's carried out in the soil cell. So there are some pictures here, which are some good diagrams that, that both show what's required for the process and what is produced in the process. So here's what's required and here's what's produced. Okay, let's, let's start our list over on the photosynthesis side. So all this information comes right from the picture. So plants need light, water, and carbon dioxide. Put that right from the picture. Plants are going to make glucose and oxygen. The glucose is then going to be used to fuel respiration in the mitochondria of plant cells. The oxygen, uh, a lot of that is just released out into the atmosphere. Some can be reused for respiration. This process happens in phytochloroplasts. It is only happening in plant cells. Over on the cellular respiration side, this diagram shows us that cells need oxygen and glucose to carry out respiration. They make carbon dioxide water and ATP. The ATP is then going to be used by that cell or other cells to carry out all of the life functions that have to occur, like synthesis and digestion and transport and regulation, all that stuff needs energy to do, and it's getting the energy through cellular respiration from the mitochondria. All living things carry out cellular respiration, whether it's an animal, a plant, a bacteria, a fungus, all living things must carry out respiration. And this process happens in the mitochondria. Okay. Um, I had given you a diagram before about how things are organized, and it went from the smallest thing to the biggest thing. Well, if we look back at what that smallest thing was, it was an organelle. If we look further inside an organelle and see what is, it is made up of, um, it's made up of different types of molecules. And there are two different types of molecules that make up all living things. One is an inorganic molecule. Something that's inorganic means it doesn't contain carbon and hydrogen. Water is an example. Water is H2O. It has hydrogen, but it doesn't have carbon with it. So we can classify it as an inorganic molecule. Any kind of salts, acids, these are all inorganic molecules. These are still required things for life. These are not bad things. Living things still need inorganic molecules. It's just a different category of molecule. Then there are molecules that contain carbon, sometimes hydrogen. Um, these are our organic molecules, like proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids. You're going to find all these things in the foods that you eat. Of those four molecules, we need to be familiar with what can it be broken down into? What is its purpose in the body? And what, give me an example of a food that we can find it in. Let's start with carbs. The simplest form of a carbohydrate has three different names. We could call it glucose. We could call it a simple sugar. We could also call it a monosaccharide. All of those names mean a really, really, really small carbohydrate. In the body, they're going to give you energy. They're going to give cells energy, and they will fuel the process of cellular respiration. You need glucose in order to carry out respiration. Carbohydrates are in lots of things that you eat. I'm only giving the two examples here. Bread has carbs in it. Pasta has carbs in it. Now those are really big carbs. That's not glucose. But your body will then break it down and break it into glucose. And then you can use it. Lipids are another organic molecule. Lipids are made up of fatty acids, glycerol. Think fat when you hear the term lipid. 
lipids are really good at helping your body store energy. So when you need to pull from the energy source um, over a long period of time, you're going to be using those lipids. Foods that you'll find lipids in, think anything oily, greasy, buttery. That's going to have lipids in it. Nucleic acids. These are molecules that are found in all living things. Um, it's, it's the DNA of an organism. Um, nucleic acids, the smallest part of them, are called nucleotides. And those nucleotides are the DNA and the RNA of all living things. So if you are eating plants or you're eating meat, you're eating the nucleic acids. You're eating the DNA of other organisms. So you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna consume more than anything else you eat. And the last one are proteins. Proteins can be broken down into their smallest component called an amino acid. Um, proteins make up enzymes. Proteins are part of your DNA. Proteins make up hormones and antibodies are all made up of proteins. Proteins are a very, very important component of your body because they make up so many things in your body. There are many different structures of proteins and depending on the structure determines what the function of the protein is. Meat that you would get protein, uh, meat, you would be consuming proteins in dairy products or fish would be very high protein foods. Um, I had mentioned enzymes, so enzymes are proteins. So I'll just show you a couple of these. Enzymes are needed for all chemical activities in the body. Now enzymes are proteins and they are necessary. They help speed up reactions, like breaking something down or making something, which is digestion or synthesis. They are found everywhere in the body. Um, we do talk about them a lot, that they're in the mouth, they're in the stomach, they're in the small intestine. Those are the probably most common places to find enzymes because we talk about it so much. That's where food is digested. But you can also find them in the pancreas. You can find them in the blood. You can find them in every cell in the body. Every single cell has enzymes because the cells have to digest or make things within the cell. So there's enzymes everywhere. Um, enzymes are a specific shape. I had mentioned before that, en that hormones were a specific shape. Well, now we're getting it again with enzymes. Enzymes are only going to fit one type of a molecule or a substrate. Enzymes work really good at your normal body temperature. So 98.6 degrees is the optimal temperature for enzymes to work at. If anything, if, if it's higher than that and you have a fever, your enzymes are going to slow down. They're not going to work to their most efficient um, capacity. If it gets too hot, enzymes might actually denature. So a denaturing means that the shape of the enzyme is changing. Once the shape of the enzyme changes, they can't use it anymore. It's not being used for its original purpose. Your body makes enzymes all the time, so if enzymes do get damaged, your body can just make more. But extreme temperatures, whether really hot or very cold, can denature enzymes, or other extreme environments, like really salty, really acidic, really basic. And there, there are many different scenarios that would impact the functionality of an enzyme. The pictures that I have here, this is a this is a illustration of digestion. So here's the substrate, this this top piece here, that's what's going to be broken down. The enzyme is at the bottom. Notice how they're going to fit perfectly together. And that enzyme is going to break apart the substrate. And now we'll see this here. We've got two products over here, two smaller pieces. So this could have been a protein. Um, and then it could be broken down into amino acids. So that covers all of the material, the necessary, most important material for the homeostasis unit, and I hope this helps.